Praise the Lord. I really enjoyed my first session. Thank you, Marius, so much for your session. Always start looking forward. I'm like a little bit like Marius. I said him this morning, I should feel nervous. Like I always do. I feel nervous when I get up to speak. But some of the nervous isn't, as Marius said, it's not nerves about getting up and talking. I've done it so much, I just don't care anymore. But it's nerves to make sure that I get it right. And it's, it's like I'm, so, I'm not so afraid of being wrong I just don't want to mess up what Yahweh is doing. And so for me, the, the whole process of the way I engage is to bring stuff that I've walked out or that I'm walking in and have learned from Yahweh so that you don't just get information, but you get the how-tos. As I said to you in the very first session, don't just look at me and listen to what I'm saying going, wow, that's really great information but rather look at the one in Scripture that I'm talking about. Because they're the ones that recorded what they did and revealed what they did in creation as a record and a window for you to explore out of their written verbiage by creating a pictorial process for yourself to walk into it. And so the more we can build pictures, the easier it is going to be to communicate with Yahweh. Yahweh very rarely does he talk in English. You know, I, I remember being in a Baptist church and also in some of the kingdom churches um, here in Hastings and somebody would prophesy, Beholdeth, saith the Lordeth. Todayeth, youeth, willeth, goeth, downeth, the roadeth. And I'm like, just speak English. Like, just because of the, 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 the stutterings in your Bible doesn't mean to say you've got to do it. And so, um, anyway, one thing that somebody has said to me today also is, why do you call God Yahweh? My question to them is, why do you call him God? Because it's in the Bible. No, it was written as the word God to take him away from his divinity and make him the same as any other God that was connected to the Romans, because this was framed by Constantine and the 70 merry men, right? Okay, moving right along. And they didn't get it all right. I don't know if you've ever looked at the Hebrew language and gone into, you know, the book of Job and gone with the original language and see what it says. It's not a camel. It's not even 300. You know, 300 camel and 25 oxen and this and that. It's not even what it says in the original language. And we read it and we go, oh, oh look, that's amazing. You had 300 camels. No. So don't just take what you read. Go into the background of it. We're the only religion in the world that reads an interpretation from the original. So... The question then is, is this the word of God? Or is it a love letter to explore a relationship with Yahweh himself where he will then begin to speak to you from the living letters, which is the word of God? So don't go, oh, it's the Bible. Like, just throw your religion away. That's all good. I don't mind you what's saying what you're saying. Yahweh will use whatever he has to. He will settle over whatever he has to to ensure that you can get it so that every opportunity, you get an opportunity to engage with him. Like with Balaam, he even used an ass, right? It's true. If you read the King James, you know, Balaam's ass spoke to him. Then he got up his ass and he beat his ass. <laughs> then his ass asked him why his ass beat him. And then he beat the ass again, and then the ass said, well, why do you beat me? Well, it's written there, like it's in my translation. I don't know about yours. Yours might go donkey. We've got to be very careful we don't believe the fables of religious structures. You can remember the first time I realized that there weren't three wise men. I was like, what? You mean to tell me I believed a lie all of my Christian life? Yes. Why? Because somebody said it. And it sounded plausible because there were three gifts because someone said it, you believe it. 
And then you believe all your thought systems out of that belief system, just like Noah was in the boat for 40 days and 40 nights. Ricky had that experience with me in his church. I did the same thing when I was in, in um, Wales, the first time I spoke in Wales. I said, I'm going to teach you all, all, all on Noah today because you, you just don't understand who Noah was. And at that stage, I'd spent just in five years with, with Moses in Genesis. Couldn't get out for five years. Who's, who's done that before? Okay. And so, and so I said, how many believe that Noah was in the boat for 40 days? And, 40? and they all put their hands up, every single one of them. This is senior pastors as well. And I said to them, you are all deceived because according to the scriptures, it was 403 days or something like that. I don't have my notes. I can't give you the exact number of what it is. I already told you 347 this morning. You know, it was from that day to this month and this month to that day. And then there was a seven days and then seven days and then the seven days and then another seven days just to make sure. Like a long time, you know, it's, it's quite a lot of days. And so, so often when we hear something for the first time, it'll shock you and you will fight with it because you're not fighting against me. You're fighting with an entrenched belief system. Let me assure you, all of us, including me, have had to go through that. I taught on first heaven, second heaven, third heaven for years I even taught that the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a spirit being. It's not even scripture. It's true. You know, scripture says very clearly our bodies are the temple, not our spirit being. And I had to stand up publicly and go, hey, I repent, guys, for teaching you wrong. Yahweh's challenging me over it and I apologize. I'm going to teach you right today. I'm going to teach you who you are as a son. And had an ark as a spirit being. Okay, anyway, blah, blah. I've always had people say to me, I even taught how to hear the voice of God. Woohoo! I used to teach conferences on how to hear the voice of God. And Yahweh, in his grace and mercy, would speak to people. And then I realized one day that Yahweh's not really interested in speaking, he's interested in showing. And so he will take it to the least common denominator so that he can even use the ass of your language to speak to you while you're sitting on it. <laughs> because the word ass is in the Bible, I can use it. It's a donkey, right? You can sit on your donkey all day and he'll still use your donkey. Whatever you're riding is the very thing that he can use to speak to you. So I said my GTR, I'm good. <laughs> Yahweh can use my donkey to speak to me anytime he likes. <laughs> and he does. <laughs> no, I just thought that was funny. I'm trying to make a serious subject lighthearted. And so, so for me in my early Christian life, as a believer, um, just got filled with the Holy Ghost and was in a Baptocostal church. It's a Pentecostal Baptist church, a Baptocostal. Okay. And um, I was a kind of hot potato because I, you know, deliverance would happen and all these things were going around me and I was, you know, just a spirit freak. And um, I couldn't figure out why other people weren't. I, I can remember, like, my heart was so hungry for Yahweh. I went through a transition in my second year as a believer. I had gone through a whole lot of deliverance in those days and um, knew nothing about the courtroom system. Went through a whole lot of deliverance, had a whole lot of things broken, and at the end of that time, at the end of that year, I can remember going through for my last session of walking through some stuff in my life. And after they had finished praying for me, I walked outside and for the first time since I'd been 13, the sky was blue, the grass was green, and I could hear birds singing. And I fell in love with Yahweh. That love has never left my life. I am so grateful for what He did to bring me to where I am. I consider I know nothing. I can answer your questions. I still consider I know nothing when I look at the enormity of what is available to us. I'm going, ur, ur, and you guys go, wow. And I'm going like, there's all this. And so for me, it's a journey going forward. And so 
I was, I was in that state of the euphoria, Lord, I, whatever you want me to do, I am in. Like, you, I am so grateful, I am in. I'm in, like, I'm in, I'm in, whatever, whatever it takes, you know. <laughs> Except singing opera is not a good idea. But it was good when I was around my kids when they were younger. Because they knew as soon as dad started going, Roar, they're going to get tickled like daylights. <laughs> my daughter's manifesting. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and so what, what would happen is for me, so I was in that, that state of, Yahweh, I'm just, I want in whatever you need to do with my life, you need to reveal it to me because I'm in. And I was outside, I used to manage a supermarket and every lunchtime I'd go outside and I'd just read the word because you know, as a Baptist, you've got to read the Word. You've got to have the Word, brother. The Word is the Word of God. I didn't realize that the Word was the introduction to Yahweh. I thought it was God. They taught it like, this was God. This, is, this was God. No, it's not. This is about Yahweh. And how to build a relationship with Him, right? Just making sure we've got the same doctrine. And um, I was laying on the grass, allowing my heart to become full. It's very important for us to allow our heart to become full. I was sitting there just in my kind of quiet place, allowing my heart to become full. And this voice, I thought it was somebody in the thicket, said, Ian. So I kind of get up, I'm serious, I get up and have a look inside the supermarket to make sure everything's all right. And there was no one in the thicket behind me. I'm like, that's weird. So I sit down and get Ian. And I'm like, my Baptist pastor didn't tell me that Yahweh was going to call me, call me by my name. So I'm there going like, this must be a demon. No, not really. I knew who it was. Why? Because my heart was full. Because I was looking at the right thing. If you look at the right thing, you'll engage in the right way. And Yahweh will reveal what he has to. But if you're not looking at the right thing, if you're looking at the book of Revelations and you're getting caught on clickbait, you will mess your life up and you will end up living 120 years on the earth and you will die. Okay, moving right along. So... I was sitting there, and he said, Ian, and he said to me, th these were the words he spoke to me, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then all of this will be added unto you. And I was like, woo, I've got a lifetime assignment. I've got my, I, and you know something? I haven't changed from the assignment. That thing is still working in my life. And when I want to remember what I'm supposed to be doing, is seeking first a kingdom, which is the dominion and the recognized power and authority, the dominion overshadowing Kratos of Yahweh's realm within a living world and realm we live here, so that creation has got something to engage with and begin to serve. It hasn't stopped. I'm still trying to figure it out. 40 years later. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Man, I tell you what, it's amazing when you start talking about righteousness, how many brainy points people want to get for themselves. You know, the things you do when you don't want to do, but the things you do really want to do when no one's looking, that you do that you don't really want to do, but you do really want to do them. Those things? Yeah, do you want to say them again? So the things you really want to do that you don't really want to do, but you do do, but you don't really want to do them, but you do them anyway because you really like them. Okay, we try and do because we've never learned how to become. So we go about doing the right things to make us feel right so that when we engage with Yahweh, we feel right. You know, the moment you do the thing you don't want to do to make yourself feel right you're still not right anyway because you've been looking at corruption. Because everything you don't want to do, you're now looking at. And what you look at, you become like. So you try not to do it. By looking at it, you're going to do it. So you, you, none of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. 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 My wife does. Praise God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> There's no confession here. Okay. And so... Um, so for me, the, this whole thing about righteousness got birthed inside of me. This is not about what I can do and the capacity I have to do right. 
You know, if we have Joshua the high priest, in other words, script in the, on the Old Covenant, I beheld Joshua the high priest standing before Yahweh and Satan standing beside him. And Yahweh looked at Joshua and said, Joshua stood before him with a filthy garment. This was the high priest of Israel. He got clean for a whole year to present himself for Yahweh so he could take a nation's sin to the second day of creation, just like, like Noah did with the earth, take the whole of the tribe of Israel into that first day, stand in the second day and bring the second day into their day and then by then removing all of the sin of Israel okay and so what would happen then so we try and do these right things but even the our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight so anything you have done to try and make yourself feel right is irrelevant I can remember having an encounter with the pillar of fire in my lounge, at home, not in my room, in my house, at home in my lounge. And so, a few people know, understand what I've just said. And so, it was burning in my lounge. At the end of seven days, I had the sword come out of the flame and go, shuk, 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 shuk. And I found myself going, but Lord, I've fed the poor. Yahweh, I've cast out devils, like lots of them. Every time I went, but, the sword came out and went, no, but, no, but, no, but, no. You kind of end up going like a chicken, chicken, going, buck, 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 buck. <laughs> Until there was nothing left. I've got to make a sound, okay? So that means I can speak another 35,000 words. And so that means there was nothing left for me to feel good about being in his presence that would justify me before his face. And then this little lamb came out of the fire and stood in front of the fire and this voice in the fire said to me, the only way you can come through to me is by the blood of the lamb. And I was like, whoop! You know what that is? That's the steam engine going past the gateway. Boop, boop. I was in. You know, and of course, fire is there, and you learn not to touch the fire, right? It's amazing how you don't have to teach a kid to stay away from, sorry, to go towards fire. You've got to teach it to stay away. Why? Because the spirit being in the child has a record of the fire it came through to come here and wants to return back to it as a spirit being. That's why it goes. And they touch the fire, ow! And then you train them to not like fire because it hurts. And the other goes, you'll pass through the fire and you shan't be burned. And we go, And so I, my main testing today is about righteousness. Why? Because it's a weapon of war to us as a 13th tribe. So the power of righteousness, when, when Yahweh talks about this kingdom and he says, seek it first, doesn't mean to seek it second. You know what comes first? Our needs. When was the last time you turned up before Yahweh? Yahweh, I engage with your kingdom as a prime source of everything in my life. Or do you go, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Lord, I've got my list, my shopping list that I want from you today. Please, just if you will, heal me. When the Word talks about His righteousness... It's a very clear statement that I'm not to seek my own righteousness. It's a very clear statement that you are not to seek your own righteousness. I'm not talking about right choices. I'm talking about trying to make you feel righteous. We are not to seek our own righteousness. Why? Why? Because when you're looking at trying to seek your own righteousness, you're still looking at corruption and beholding it, and you become the very thing you don't want to become, because you're looking at it. So when we engage His righteousness, it's about our eyes being caught on Him. Why? Because what you behold, you will become like. The word says, as in a mirror, darkly, as we gaze upon him, we get changed into his image from glory to glory. It's darkly because it's a place of mystery. 
No, because they're full of demons there. It's about his righteousness, the power that he gives us. Yahweh literally stands. David said this. I'm off my notes. I don't care now. Blessed is the man into whom Yahweh imputes righteousness. Blessed is he. Let's talk about the word impute you know, from King Jimmy. Impute means to be forcefully put in without your cooperation, whether you like it or not, you are going to get it put in. And you know how we get it put in? I come through the blood, through the body of your son, and I turn up, Father, and you give me righteousness. Because righteousness, of course, is right standing. I'm not talking about holiness. Holiness is a whole different issue. Righteousness empowers holiness to make you make the right choices so that we can become holy in what we do on the face of the earth because without holiness, no man shall see Yahweh. So don't tell me you can't see. So what does this word impute mean? What it does is it means an empowerment of equity back to innocence so that as a just one, you can walk out that innocence in union with Yahweh as an equal with his son. So amazing how the world today, especially with the feminine movement, has strived for equality. And I understand it. But the issue isn't equality. The issue is the necessity of equity, which produces equality, which then through equity, producing equality, you can stand together as equals. What Yahweh does is he comes along to you and he goes, oh, you've turned up. And he pushes righteousness into you to give you all the equity you need from heaven to live your life out here within creation. He gives it to you. You don't even have to, you realize you don't even have to ask it? What a silly thing I'm going to be doing. Yahweh, impute to me righteousness. Like, what do you think he's going to do? He can't give you any more than he's already given to you. Perhaps you don't understand the pain of what it means to have something imputed into you. It's like putting a seed into the ground, into dry ground, crushing the seed into the ground until the ground goes and absorbs it. We will not be able to express the kingdom of God properly within our life until we grasp the importance of the role of righteousness that has been given to us because they go hand in hand with one another. We cannot appreciate the kingdom without righteousness. You cannot appreciate righteousness without the kingdom. They work together as a gate and a doorway of entry for you and I to have access to everything that Yahweh has. So what does righteousness do in us? Righteousness creates a byproduct called holiness. Holiness produces the glory of Yahweh. That produces a tangible reality of Yahweh on the earth being revealed through you. One of the things that the gifts have caused in the body of Christ is to avoid the necessity for a holy life. I'm serious. I know someone personally who was in major signs and wonders in the face of the earth 15 years ago, living in abject fornication with students, the next day being drunk, 
and the next morning going on the stage in a massive public arena and producing signs and wonders. Because signs and wonders don't qualify holiness. Because it's a gift. But your lifestyle and union in the hidden place is the thing that qualifies you for greatness. That's what qualifies us in our life. We've just been in South Africa. When these two beings, I, like it was amazing, no one got killed that I'm aware of from the two tornadoes. One of the things I've learned to ask for is to spare life now. When these things start happening, Yahweh, spare life. Whatever you do, spare life. You can do what you like with creation because creation is drawing towards us, but spare the lives of men. I learned that one the hard way. What righteousness does is it produces in us. When these, sorry, when these beings came onto the coast of Africa, and I'm talking about Africa now, because South Africa is part of Africa, right? So when you do it for one nation, you do it for the tectonic plate. When you do it for the tectonic plate, you do it for the earth. When you do it for the earth, you do it for the solar system. Because when one piece wins, all win. No, you didn't hear what I'm saying. When one of us achieves, because of the union between us all, when one of us achieves, we all win. That's how you become a burden bearer for your brother. It's not to pray for them, but to lead a lifestyle of union that helps them bear their burden because you've now become successful. Righteousness sanctifies and adjusts behavioral patterns that are entrenched in our subconscious and unconsciousness, changing our desires that dwell in us to become His desires. Oh, let me talk about this. Listen, Yahweh has come to us and gone, here is everything I give you, I've given you all, I like Marius today, I've given you all of this. And the problem is, if we go home and we carry on doing what we tried to do yesterday to make myself feel right by making the right choices without the understanding that I've been empowered by holiness, and so by righteousness, and I need to look at righteousness, not look at doing the thing I don't want to do. You look at righteousness, and then what you don't want to do will fall off you because it's got no reference point now to hinge itself on you and attach itself to you. And so what Yahweh does is he goes, here is it all. Now, if you keep your eyes hooked into that and you walk with your eyes hooked into that, the desires that are in the righteousness of Yahweh become your desires. Then Yahweh can sit next to you and go, you want your desires? Here they are. I'll give you everything. Because it's not about what we do. We are a vessel and the sooner we see that for ourselves, the better we're going to understand what Yahweh has given us. This righteousness is a power. <sighs> righteousness restores the innocence, thus destroying Lucifer's access, creating an irrelevancy for him in your life. Don't ever come to me and go, Oh, I got slimed by the devil. Don't ever write on my, on my Discord page, oh, I got slimed the other day. Don't ever, because you're gonna, you will get a nice little epistle from Uncle Ian. <laughs> the only reason you get slimed is because your eyes are in the slime. The only reason you get backlash is because your eyes are caught in corruption and corruption can find a way to engage with you to keep you tethered to the very thing you don't want. The day I was with Yahweh and sitting in council with him, and I don't mean like listening to a voice, right? Sitting in my home going, listen, speak to me, Yahweh. Talk to me, Jesus. Talk to me. I want to hear your voice. I'm sitting at a table face to face, which is what we're supposed to do as a priest and as a son, right? We're supposed to mediate face to face like Moses did, 
right? I'll just make sure we've got the same doctrine. Okay, our job isn't to die and then one day see Yahweh. Our job is to die and see Yahweh at the same time because no flesh and glory in his presence and that's where you die is in his presence. It's sitting in council with Yahweh and he said to me, show the devil your future. Some of you heard me say this. Show the devil your future. And I'm like, Yahweh, I don't want to show him anything. And he goes, show the devil your future. Now, when Yahweh says it once, you can argue. Because he wants to teach you how to argue, to justify your position and where you stand and why. So my stance was, I don't want to show him anything. That wasn't the answer he was looking for. And now he says, show the devil your future. And I was like, okay, you said it, I'm going to do it. And this wasn't a voice. I'm sitting in my lounge. I was in my house in my room, not in my home in the lounge, okay? And so... In council with Yahweh, because the devil, show the devil. So I go into my heart. Yahweh says he puts eternity in, in your heart. Well, I've had an amazing revelation on that, and now what was hers is now mine. And so Yahweh yeah, 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 put eternity in our hearts. He put eternity in our hearts, which means the first realm of the record of where Yahweh was manifested is the realm of eternity. He put that realm in your heart. And then there was the works of old, and the days of old, and the beginning of his ways, and then create, and then um, the beginning, and then creation. You know how it goes on in Proverbs 8, like you all listen to the recordings? Okay. So I'm going looking for this realm of eternity in here. Open the gate, and I go, I'm serious. I go looking for Lucifer. Yahweh said it, cross council table. I'm in a good, safe place. I'll go looking for the devil. I'm serious. I started turning the timeline backwards and forwards, trying to find him. You know the wheel? Within the wheel, within the wheel. Don't move a cog unless you're prepared for consequences. Moving the cog to try and find Lucifer in the gate of eternity somehow. <laughs> I couldn't see him. And I hear, ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, oh, no. I know what that laugh all means. It's like that laugh is one point Yahweh, zero Ian. Okay? I come out of my engagement and I look over Yahweh and he goes, ha, 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 did you see him? And I said, no. And he goes, well, why do you make him relevant for your life then? Why are you so preoccupied with him? When he has no say so, he is irrelevant to you and there's no power over your life. Why are you looking at him? That was the last time, nine years ago, when the days of war finished for me. I've not done a day of spiritual warfare since because it's irrelevant. I have nothing to, it's he, he is irrelevant to my life. My only enemy I have is death, according to scripture. That's our only enemy. So what I'm doing, trying to teach people how to undo death. Noah is the latest one. Go walk through the days of Noah. See what happens with your life. Why? Because you get so focused into the right thing. What is irrelevant becomes irrelevant, and there is no power found in you for it to tether into because your flesh is being converted to righteousness through a gift given to bow to empower holiness where all you can do is see Yahweh. What time does, wow, 20 to 3. I've done half a page of three pages of notes. Okay. Oh, you surprised here. Land the plane. <laughs> okay. Righteousness has its basis in three main things. The first one is it joins you with Yahweh himself. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? Good little scripture for you to meditate around. If I am the righteousness of God, that means that I already stand fully in a realm being completely given to me, utterly empowered to walk out the truth that now occupies my heart and life, which is my one focus. The next thing is, I've got to be in something. 
because this is not about you doing your thing. You know, in him we live and move and have our being. In Christ, we are this. Christ in me. So I'm in him and he's in me. Why? Because if I learn how to be in him, then only what will be seen is the external part of my life, which will be Christ. Your word in means in, like not outside looking at or outside looking hopefully that I'm in. It means going in. Righteousness is a gift that is put into us to become an armor. The day is fast means the night is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The armor of light is the outer covering of the empowerment of righteousness through holy lifestyle where now all that is visibly seen is the glory of the presence of Christ in whom you now are positioned. Who is this God that I see in you? Not me, you. I wonder, wonder how many people would be here if I disappeared from here, appeared at the back of the wall, still talking to you on the microphone. I wonder how many people in Hastings would try and clamor into here to see something. And the reason they want to see it is because they don't want to do the lifestyle of it because it's a nice feeling to see something that's supernatural, but to walk the lifestyle is a journey of a lifetime. It's within the basis of righteousness that we are able to experience the different realms of heaven. Can you remember the first time I walked into the realm of the angels? It's not the angelic realm that's here. It's a completely different realm and arena changed my belief system about what angels do and who they are. Righteousness has its basis in the very character and actual nature of Yahweh himself. The word says this, God, Yahweh, is righteous and there is none above him. It's so weird. Christians seem to have this thing about being afraid of being, being called, likened unto the Son of God because I'm not worthy. Who told you you weren't worthy? You did. I'm not worthy. Irrelevant. The blood's made you worthy. Righteousness is being given to you, and don't think you're so powerful that you can take away from Yahweh himself. We seem to have this thing that we're so awesomely, amazingly powerful, we can take some of Yahweh's glory away from him when I say I'm bearing the image of his glory. All you do is add to his preeminence. Why? Because you become a reflection of the very thing you're looking at. Just so I can quote a scripture for you, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I'll give you the passage in the Bible. I've already quoted 27 different scriptures to you. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Oh. It doesn't say he that is joined to the Lord is one with him. It says he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Breath, pneuma, power, eternal life. You are now the complete representative of that union being fully expressed in the earth, revealing the nature of the one you are in union with. Don't think you can take away from Yahweh's glory by presenting yourself in that place of union. One spirit, one life, that's a breath of pneuma that Yahweh has given so that we can be empowered to become instead of do. When you are joined to someone... You are joined to their character and their nature and are influenced by them and influence them. Do you realize we can influence Yahweh in his decisions? Do you realize you can argue Yahweh out of the position he's taken? You know, Moses did that, right? He said that earlier on yesterday. Well, no, he said it to the students or earlier on today. Moses argued with Yahweh told them to repent twice in Scripture. Imagine telling the God of the universe, repent of this deed you have against your people. This is the God of the universe. 
who's burning with fire, going to walk right to Moses and kill all the children of Israel because he's angry with them. Yahweh seems to forget stuff when he's angry, like he forgot Noah. No, I just thought that was funny because you guys are like this. <laughs> you see, when Yahweh empowers us for something, he gives us the capacity to dwell in union. If you dwell in union, nothing of a corrupt nature can touch you. Because what happens is your heart begins to respond second by second, minute by minute, which keeps you in the love of God. Love is not love. I just love. Just love. It's just love. It's all about love. Well, God's love. That's why it's all about love. But love isn't all about love. Love is all about justice and judgment, grace and mercy. That's the four faces of love. Anyone who says, oh, it's all about love. It's just the love. You've got to love. you just got to love. They have no idea about the justice and judgment of Yahweh. But Yahweh never judges to death. He only judges that which he sees life on. And by judging that which he sees life on, death dies itself. So let's talk about, I had an encounter with that angel that walked into Egypt, right? You call it the angel of death? Sitting with this angel, most beautiful seven and a half foot being, full of glory, carrying a sword. And it said to me, I did not go to bring death. I only went to gaze upon that which was alive and that which had the righteous blood on the doorposts. All that which didn't died of its own accord because it was not righteous. In James 2.23, there is a process and a progression. We must believe. It gets imparted to us once it's imparted to us, we are then called the friend of God. The moment, like, like, did you hear what I just said? No, okay, you didn't. The moment Yahweh goes, righteousness, hoo, hoo, into you, you become the friend of God. We, we are friends of God. Not just for, for, for family. Jesh is my friend as well as my son, part of my family. But he's a friend. Kay's a friend outside of being my wife. Marius is a friend. Thank God he's not my wife. No, I just thought that was funny. <laughs> Ricky's my friend. John's my friend. Lindy's my friend. A lot of you guys in here are my friends. Now, do you realize that when we share breath in a room like this, I'm now in you? They've just discovered, like we've been talking about this stuff for a wee while now, about breath carrying the record of the genetics and what happens with it when you breathe one another in and how now I'm in you and you're in me and that if you don't love yourself, you'll never be able to love your neighbor and the way you love your neighbor is by putting your breath into them. You know how all that stuff goes that we've talked about for years? Okay. And so when you're in a room like this, you've breathed every single person in this room together and so where the brethren dwell together, there Yahweh commands a blessing so that the way you gather together is in one another. It's not the right doctrine. And I'm the same doctrine. They gather together in a room. Where's the room? Your lungs! <laughs> Unless you haven't been breathing. Then you need to be up here talking. <laughs> Righteousness. <laughs> uh, righteousness is a gift. Yeshua's death on the cross destroyed the power of sin, but we must deal with the desires of sin. Righteousness cannot be earned by fervent religious practice or the religious laws we put in place to stop our sinning. There's a difference between sin and sinning, right? Right? It's not based on your successes in dealing with your sin. It's not based on a, I won't today. 
It's a gift given by Yeshua himself when he hung on the cross revealed in Isaiah 53. The cross is the place of exchange where he went through death. He took all that we had done, destroying the yoke of it once and for all. But now the problem is you've got to walk that out in your life. Don't come to me and go, oh, you just got to believe. Yeah, well, you believe to what? Believe in what? Believe why? It's not just believe. You must have answers to understand some of these things. Righteousness will always have the power over unrighteousness. But it's our choice that instigates righteousness here through the gift given to empower holiness. Righteousness is an armor. We've done that. The primary purpose of the armor of righteousness is for defense. It is not for attack. So how do I, what are some practical things that we can do to begin to engage as a tribe to unlock this technology of the power of righteousness? Repent. Repent doesn't mean going, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm so sorry for this that I've done. I'm so sorry for this that I've done, Jesus. This, this is all my stuff. I'm so sorry, Jesus. I'm so sorry. Wow. I'm so sorry for all of this that I've done. And then you walk around like this. I'm so sorry. It's, it's not about looking at what you are doing. It's about looking at a realm and into a way where what you are beholding you become, which takes that away from you because your eyes are no longer caught in it. Instead of being caught in this thing of trying to stop doing what you want to do, the things you really want to do when no one's looking at you. It's called a clamor of unholiness in us, which is activated by choices. Repentance means turning back towards the perfect estate of awe, beholding that awe in wonder, creating the inability to express what you are now beholding that you are also now becoming. So many people reject the gift of righteousness that we earn through simply going in. We receive, we must receive by faith. I dream my personal life in my mind when I'm speaking in the spirit as a spirit being speaking or the Holy Spirit speaking through me, keeping my mind occupied while I speak mysteries unto Yahweh, all the different ways you speak in tongues. For those of me in the schools, amen. For those who haven't, you don't know what I'm talking about. That's okay. Get the recordings later or come to the school. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. When, when we function in the way that we are supposed to, when we speak those mysteries, we begin to behold them and they will captivate and capture your heart. They'll capture your mind. We must receive it by faith, dreaming about it. I dream about what it's gonna be like to be completely holy and righteous without any record in me where corruption is no more and there is no more clamor. You gotta be really careful what you ask for, right? I was in my, in my lounge at home, um, yeah, in my in my home, not in my house, in my lounge at home, and um, just turned my heart towards Yahweh going, Yahweh, I so long to know what it's gonna be like in that day, because I thought I had to die to become holy and righteous. You know, that was in the Baptocostal days, and, um, or in the Pentecostal days in another church I was in. And I, used, I was in, in, in engaging in my lounge going, Yahweh, I wanna know what, you gotta be careful what you ask for, right? I heard this, and my roof of my lounge disappeared. And this thing comes at 90 miles an hour straight towards me, warm, picks me up and goes out from the earth. I was like, whoa, ah! And it started going, 
faster than light speed, thought speed, going faster than any speed I know of anywhere, because our earth went, shoo, and our moon went, shoo, and I saw the earth and the moon, and I saw our solar system go, ding, 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 ding. And then, then the stars started disappearing, and there was this massive stuff, and it went right outside our little galaxy on this thing in about 20 seconds. You know what that is, eh? Okay. Yeah. Some relieve themselves through shock and wonder at the awe they're now beholding. Mine was just stark terror. <laughs> and this thing suddenly stopped, and I was there, and there was nothing. Absolutely no clamor, no record of nothing. There was nothing outside our galaxy. And I was like, you know that ah moment? Because I've got the feeling. And I've got the Noah in my Noah, in my gut, and in my heart. And then my brain processed the information until my body stored it. That all happened in about another 20 seconds. It was like, whoa. And now I'm going right back where I came from. It was like, whoa. Because all these planets, I'm serious. And I see the Earth, this little green ball go, and all our planets go, dang, dang, dang. And I'm going, oh, dunghill, this is accident waiting to happen. Serious. I'm serious. Into my, like literally, the Earth, I saw New Zealand and my house, and I'm going 190 miles an hour, even faster than bang into my body and I'm going oh, 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 oh. <laughs> thank you Jesus thank you Jesus <laughs> it's amazing how we thank him when he's still alive and it wasn't even trying to destroy us <laughs> but I got it I got it and I know what it feels like so when I turn to engage with Yahweh to engage with his righteousness, I engage with the entirety of the emotional connection to the position he took me into to give me understanding about that day. And I could dream about it. I sit there and I think about that day. And what that day is, I don't look at my stuff. It's irrelevant anyway, because the moment you're going, it becomes irrelevant. You know how it works? Okay, maybe you don't. Okay, I do. I know how it works, because I do a lot of stuff. And every day, Engaging with process, Yahweh. Dream me a why, because it captivates my heart. And then very short, it's very soon, what begins to happen is you begin to live out of the supply of another world. And no longer does the, the lust of this world engage with you, except in my car. <laughs> And that's not, that's not lust. That's just a wonder and an apparition. It's like people look at it and they wonder, and I'm the apparition. It's all good. <laughs> Listen, righteousness has been given to us. It's a gift from Yeshua, from Yahweh himself, to empower us to do what we've got to do. One of the technologies I believe that Yahweh is returning to us as a 13th house is the technology of believing again for that realm to be completely operational around our lives where we no longer have to try and not do something. We, we don't do it now because we become something else. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>